<clears throat> okay. So nerve physiology. The nervous system. You can see a nerve in the lower right. We're going to dissect this out. Look at the microanatomy. You can see connection of nerves up top in the upper left. What's the whole purpose of this system? Well, the, the whole purpose of the system, did my audio just cut out or is it okay? Good? Okay. The whole purpose of the system is to connect you with your internal environment as well as your external environment. And so the way that we do this is by utilizing a system that has sensory input. That's like a detector. We call that sensory input afferent input with an A. Then it sends it to a network or a connector that moves it from the periphery to the central nervous system, and that connector is called an interneuron. That's integration. So you have the perception of the sensation, you integrate the sensation, and then you do something with it. You have output. And that's the third one, which is the motor output, like muscles and glands. Now in the skin, we talked about like a sweat response, right? Perspiration. We talked about how if you're Nervous, you might sweat a little bit more. Well, those glands are actually the output. Those are the motor output, which we refer to as efferent, E. You have a nervous uh, episode before an exam, or before you look at your score, or before you, you know, answer the text, or answer the phone call. Well, nobody does that, so answer the text. And your heart rate goes up. That's muscle output efferent pathways to cardiac muscle. So this is really the whole point of the nervous system, is to integrate a signal inside the body or outside the body, some stimulus, afferent, connect it via interneurons to the central nervous system. The central nervous system, which is made up of the spinal cord and the brain, processes it and tells it what to do, and then sends it back out via efferent motor pathways to do something about it. That's the decision tree. So we organize it in two very simple categories, two buckets, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Very, very easy. Now again, why do we call it this? Because anatomists like to label things. They like to categorize. The body doesn't really care. There are some classification differences that are obvious that we're going to get into. And so you'll kind of see why we, we put two buckets in these categories because the periphery, which is outside the brain and the spinal cord, tends to have different cell types. It has different glial cells. It actually doesn't, uh, the, the central nervous system doesn't regenerate, whereas the peripheral nervous system does to some extent. So an example there is you have a car accident patient that comes in. It's a C2 fracture of the spinal cord. That's quadri paralegic paralysis. That spinal cord today, the conventional wisdom is, it will not regenerate, it will not heal. There are some unique circumstances, but generally speaking, spinal cord injury patients don't have a great prognosis. Some of you have friends, family that fall into that category. Peripheral nervous system, you have surgery. Uh, your surgical site feels numb and tingling after it heals. That surgical site that is numb and tingling maybe shrinks over time because the nerves in the periphery can regenerate to a certain extent, whereas the nerves in the central nervous system do not. Huge area of research looking at how do we regenerate central nervous system nerves. And we can go off on a tangent there. I don't do that research, but others do. That could be you. So <clears throat> the central nervous system is this integrating command center Right, the central processing unit, like your computer. The peripheral nervous system links the body to the central nervous system. You've got spinal nerves that come off the spinal column. You have cranial nerves, which are part of the peripheral nervous system. <clears throat> There's 12 of them. You'll study these in lab. I'm not going to test you. I'm in lecture. You'll study the cranial nerves in lab. <clears throat> 
we sub subdivide the peripheral nervous system into a couple of different categories. We have sensory and we have motor. Sensory is what word? Afferent. I, I, like, I like to emphasize the A, so I call it afferent. So I remember A. Motor is efferent with an E. The sensory afferent or afferent, if you want to say that, neither is wrong or more correct. I'm just trying to give you tools on how to remember. That gets you information from sensory receptors to the central nervous system, like we talked about before. We will refer to these as somatic afferent fibers or visceral afferent fibers. Somatic is referring to skin, skeletal muscle, joints. Visceral is from like the internal organs of the viscera, abdominal and thoracic cavities. Now the motor pathway, efferent, takes information from the central nervous system to the effector. The effector or the effector organs could be muscles, glands, tissue. This one's divided into two main parts, the motor pathway. We've got the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. So I'm just following this decision tree right here, peripheral, sensory motor, somatic, visceral, right? Now we're going into autonomic dividing into um, somatic. So the somatic is under voluntary control. Central nervous system to skeletal muscles. You hear a sound. That's a sensation. You send a signal to the brain. The brain says, that sounds like a bear. You send a signal to the muscle efferent pathways of the lower limb and say, run away. Somatic, under voluntary control. Autonomic, also referred to as visceral. Autonomic and visceral are interchangeable terms. Involuntary control regulates things like smooth muscle. Involuntary control. So smooth muscle lines the GI tract, your esophagus, blood vessels, um, sphincter openings in the body. Lower esophageal sphincters, upper esophageal sphincter, pyloric sphincter, emptying out of the stomach into the small intestine. This system, autonomic, also known as visceral, so we're right here, is further broken down into sympathetic and parasympathetic. Who can share with us what these two divisions do? Parasympathetic and sympathetic. That's right. Sympathetic is fight or flight. Parasympathetic is rest and digest. And you're like, what are you talking about? So fight or flight are things that ramp you up so you're going to stay and fight or you're going to run away. Activities that boost, elevate, increase heart rate, respirations, metabolic activity, cranking out more ATP. That's sympathetic activity. Things that keep you awake. Parasympathetic activity is slowing down the system. That's a resting situation, like when you're sleeping. Parasympathetic activity. Interesting enough, post-meal, there's a flood of parasympathetic activity because you actually want most of your blood volume to shunt to the gut so you can absorb the nutrition from the meal that you just had. So you shunt blood away from the exercising muscle or skeletal muscle, and you, you, you shunt it towards the core so that you can absorb that nutrition. That's one of the reasons you kind of get a little sleepy after you eat a big meal, right? It's also why if you eat a big meal and then you try to exercise, you actually get cramps, right? Because your, your blood is only, your blood volume is being moved to the area that it's needed the most on a parasympathetic situation or demand. All right. <clears throat> So these are the overview of the nervous system, kind of the purpose of the nervous system, 
how it's organized, how it's broken down. And now we're going to start diving into the microanatomy of the nervous system. We're going to talk about nerves and glial cells. <clears throat> I am going to post tonight pictures of glioblastoma, okay, that come from a student, grad student of mine in the lab. She's growing them. They came from a patient. Pretty phenomenal. I'm trying to think if I have them. I don't have them here. So I'll post them on the announcement. I'll put them up tonight or tomorrow at the latest. But you all have heard of glioblastoma, right? No? Senator John McCain passed from it. So glioblastoma is a cancer of the central nervous system in the brain primarily of glial cells. That's why it's called glioblastoma. So what the heck is a glial cell? So let me introduce this. And now when you start seeing the news about glioblastoma, you'll understand why it's such an aggressive cancer, why patients usually don't survive much longer than six months with a glioblastoma. Um, I had a really close uh, high school colleague that passed away like 10 years ago from glioblastoma, believe it or not. He was really young. And he knew, he got diagnosed, and he kind of went on this world tour, um, and he called me before he went to kind of say goodbye, and went on this world tour, and, and I don't know exactly when it happened. But that was Senator John McCain. A lot of your family members and friends may have been struck by glioblastoma. So knowing the physiology and the anatomy will help you kind of understand where these diseases fit in. So what the heck are glial cells? Well, neurons get all the attention, and we're going to focus on neurons at the end. Neurons are the excitable cell. Neurons are the electrical signal. Neurons are like the wiring in the wall. They actually transmit low voltage electricity throughout your body. You can measure it. You can block it. You can trigger it or stimulate it. But they're millivolts. They're a thousandth of a volt. Like a thousand millivolts equals one volt. The volts that come out of the wall are like 110 in this country, right? Where I'm headed next week, it's 220s. I got to bring like a little box converter, right? You guys have seen this. Our body moves electricity. It moves electricity down neurons, which are excitable cells. The way that we do that, folks, is utilizing ions that have a charge. You remember that in the first unit? Sodium, positive charge. Potassium, positive charge. Remember we had a, a transporter that would shuttle three sodium out of the cell and two potassium into the cell to create a slight imbalance of positive charges? And I had you memorize that, and then I tested you twice on it because it's really important, and we're going to use it now. So if you're still wrestling with the sodium-potassium ATPase pump, which you should have had like in four other classes, right? If you had it, you had it on two exams, please talk to the TAs and the SIs and let's get this down. But now we're going to start using it. And that's where we're headed at the end of the lecture, is talking about that ion difference at the membrane. Well, the neuron is what leverages the movement of those ions. And the movement of those positively charged ions creates the electrical gradient, or the potential is what we call it. That creates the electrical charge that's able to travel down a nerve. That's what allows you and I to be alive. Now, they get all the attention because that's pretty important, but they have a lot of support, right? Like, I'm the one that lectures, but I have a lot of support. I can't do this without the SI's support, the TA's support. I can't do this without my department support. You know, even other TA's and other grad students that you see in the exam day, or like Eva, my master student, I'm going to grab her data and show it to you about glioblastoma a little later on an announcement, and you'll be like, wow, that's interesting, right? So a lot of support. The supporting cells are the neuroglial cells. Now, they're nine to ten times more common than neurons, far more prevalent. There's four different types in the central nervous system and only two in the periphery, and that's one of the reasons we categorize the periphery and the central nervous system differently. We have different neuroglial cells. So if we look at 
the central nervous system, the first neuroglial cell is the most abundant. It's called the astrocyte. The astrocyte functions for supporting and bracing the neuron, allowing for exchange of nutrition between capillaries, blood perfusing. The, the astrocyte carries that nutrition to the nerve. The astrocyte helps guide young neurons during development and embryonic development. It does a neurotransmitter function, cleanup. When neurotransmitters are done being used, the recycling of them is through the astrocyte. Most prevalent support cell in the central nervous system, known as a glial cell. Second uh, glial cell, microglia. This functions like a small macrophage, microglia. It's the cleanup cell. It, it phagocytoses small particles, cellular debris. If there's an infection, we'll talk about this later in subsequent lectures, like if there's meningitis, a bacterial infection, a viral infection, or a fungal infection, all of those could cause meningitis, your microglia will help to combat that infection. They're like a macrophage, a small macrophage. Third, ependymal cell. This produces the cerebral spinal fluid. The cerebral spinal fluid is a plasma-like fluid. It's filtrate from the bloodstream that bathes the entire brain and spinal cord. It's like, you remember bobbing for apples? You have apples in a basket of water or a bin of water and they float? That's really what our brain and spinal cord do, is they sit in a cavity that's actually full of fluid. And so they float inside that cavity. And that fluid perfuses through the brain and the spinal cord through the ventricular system. You'll see this more in lab. And we'll get into it in subsequent lectures. <clears throat> yes? I don't. I don't know why it forms the halo. I'm sorry. You had a question over here earlier, and I ignored you, didn't I? Sorry about that. I don't want to ask you one. That's okay. Ask me afterwards. Okay. Was it on the first topic? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Appreciate that. Okay, so now we're G-rated. Like when, like, someone gets a concussion and they lose spinal fluid, is that what the... Yep. Okay. Yep. Then you've ruptured that ventricular system. That's a big problem. And I would say that's not really a concussion. That's more of a contusion. That's more of a next level seriousness. If you're leaking CSF, you're bleeding out the ear, you should go to the emergency department right away. Yeah. That's not just a simple, I mean, a concussion is serious, but that's a, that's a whole nother level. Yeah. And we'll talk more about that, but those ependymal cells are what are functioning. Oh, and I should probably point to these. So here's the ependymal cells. They're lining that surface, and they filter the blood to create the cerebral spinal fluid. You have about 150 milliliters of cerebral spinal fluid. That's it. And there's a lot of things, I'm kind of foreshadowing, but there's a lot of things that actually will dry out fluids, dehydrate you, right? Like caffeine and alcohol does that. So the post-fun night morning problem, big issue is associated with low cerebral spinal fluid. And that brain and uh, uh, spinal cord is actually resting in your skull cap. And that's why you have such a bad headache. So hydration does work. Liquid IV, yeah, this stuff works. Regular IV, yeah, that works too. Yeah. Yeah, so the question's about conjoined twins. Is it the... the difference or the convoluted part of that is there's no two conjoined twins that are the same. So they could have very separate central nervous system setups. And if they, if they determine that under imaging, then they'll go ahead with the surgery. But if they're sharing too much of the central nervous system, they won't do it. Okay. Um, you can see the neuron here depicted. You can see the microglia down here. And then you can see, I, I already pointed out the epidymal cells, astrocyte. 
see how this astrocyte kind of links between the capillary and the actual nerve? Right? So the last one that we need to talk about is the oligodendrocyte. The oligodendrocyte actually myelinates the nerve. And we'll talk about myelin and its purpose next week's lectures. But the short answer is myelin helps to speed up the signal, the action potential. Okay, it's, it's like the difference between like 3G and 5G. Make sense? Putting in today's world. Where you're sending a signal, if you myelinate it, you actually send the signal faster, and we'll explain the details about how the action potential moves differently, more efficiently, more quickly in a myelinated neuron. But it takes a lot of biological energy to wrap the nerve with myelin. Because students are always asking, well, why don't you just myelinate all the nerves in the body? It would go faster. Well, the problem is it takes a lot of biological energy to do that. And so you only wrap myelinated nerves and they have a white appearance in the central nervous system and that's known as white matter and the unmyelinated neurons in the in the brain that are unwrapped are gray matter and that's the two differences and you can see that in dissection in lab now in the peripheral nervous system we only have two so we only have what we refer to as satellite cells and schwann cells now satellite cells mimic or act um, like astrocytes. So they kind of provide nutrition. They support. They insulate the uh, neuron soma and regulate that chemical environment metabolically like, a, like an astrocyte. And then <clears throat> the second one is referred to as the Schwann cell, which creates myelinated sheaths in the periphery like what the oligodendrocyte does in the central nervous system. Now I'm going to back it up to this picture. Cancer of any one of these glial cells in the brain is glioblastoma. Oftentimes it's an astrocyte because they're the most abundant, but it could be any of them. And when they become cancerous and they mutate and they grow out of control, you can't really tell what they were because they don't look like what they were. But that's glioblastoma, is a mutation in the brain, central nervous system, of any one of these glial cells. Yeah? Does, does a particular glial cell that's metastasizing make a difference in the survivability of the patient? We don't know, but so what my grad student is studying right now is um, these, a prior grad student actually demonstrated that these glial cells in the brain, when they mutate, they actually move down myelin tracks or they move down blood vessel tracks. So they move down a pattern. And <clears throat> they have a, a propensity to find that like roadway so that they can metastasize. And so if you can disrupt that roadway, like if you put these glial cells on a disorganized pattern, they don't grow, they just stay put. If you put them on a pattern that has like roadways, scaffolds that actually have directional fibers, they move like crazy. And so that's more of an indicator of like patient prognosis is how quickly the mutated glial cell can get to a myelinated fiber or to a blood vessel. The problem is in the brain you have a lot of those. Right? So they try to catch it early. Now, myelin sheaths, a disease, glioblastoma is one. We're going to talk about another one. Um, MS, multiple sclerosis. So this is a disease that's an autoimmune disease in patients where your body's immune system actually targets and destroys the myelin sheath in both the periphery as well as in the central nervous system. It goes slow, and there's medications that we can use and treatments that we can use to slow the progression down. But ultimately, in MS patients, what's happening is that nerve degenerates over time. It's like the wiring in the wall is being eaten away. That's multiple sclerosis. You're going to be able to review a, a paper about MS in this unit, and you'll learn a little bit more. But that's where, you know, kind of a connection to the clinical world of 
multiple sclerosis, as well as glioblastoma. So let's talk a little bit about these myelin sheaths. <clears throat> so remember when we talked about the phospholipid bilayer, right? It's obviously the lipid. What else is in the phospholipid bilayer? What's embedded in it? Protein. So you have a layer of fat with protein that's embedded in it. That is what you wrap around the nerve. The cell, the Schwann cell in the periphery, it creates like a long tail. And as it grows, it grows around the nerve and leaves behind its membrane, its cell membrane. Is it leaves it behind its cell membrane? It's like, have you ever made like those pigs in a blanket where you take like sausage or hot dogs or something and you get like crescent roll dough and then you, you roll the, you know, the, the sausage in the dough? Or have you ever made um, cinnamon rolls? All right, you get a, a, a piece of dough and you, you roll it slowly and then you look at it on end. That's what you're doing right here. So you can kind of appreciate this is the nucleus of the Schwann cell, and all of this is the myelin sheath that it's left behind as it's wrapping the nerve. So when I say biological energy, that cell had to do that. Now, you got to do that over the length of the nerve. You need lots of cells doing that. That's a lot of ATP. That's a lot of nutrition. That's a lot of energy. So you do that sparingly in the body. You don't just do that everywhere. Make sense? So... <clears throat> The neural lemma, this neural lemma is the outermost part that houses the nucleus of the Schwann cell and the cytoplasm. So the neural lemma is this, this outer portion. And <clears throat> this, this is just depicting the Schwann cell as it, as it kind of creates a cinnamon roll effect as it, as it rolls. Well, in between these spaces where you have bare axon, we call that a node of Ranvier. It's a French investigator, so you wouldn't say note of Ranvier, right? That would be overly American. And Ranvier is probably a butchering, and my grad student is French, so she laughs at us all the time. But node of Ranvier, that's the bare axon. And the action potential that we'll learn about actually moves inside and underneath intracellularly and kind of does ion exchange at the nodes. And that's where the action potential exchanges ions. And we'll talk about that here in the next few lectures, OK? The oligodendrocytes do this exact same thing in the central nervous system. I'm showing the Schwann cell. But in the central nervous system, if it's myelinated by the oligodendrocyte, that's the white matter. If it's not myelinated, then that's the gray matter or unmyelinated. So I talked a little bit about spinal cord injury patients. Right? Some of these topics are not fun, but these are the reality. And this is what many of you are moving on to treat and take care of. Right? So you have peripheral nerves that are damaged. How do they regenerate? And then you're going to ask, why don't central nervous system nerves do the same thing? And I'll explain that here in a second. So the peripheral ner nervous system, the myelin sheath actually reforms what we refer to as a regeneration tube. So you have a severed nerve. The myelin remains intact. The myelin extends and kind of creates this track by which the nerve can kind of find. It's like finding the eyelet in a needle with the thread. It actually is trying to find where do I grow, and it gives it the track to grow down. Make sense? So that's the regeneration tube that peripheral nerves appreciate and can benefit from. And that's how they'll regenerate. So this sequence of images is showing a normal nerve fiber, the myelin sheath, innervating a muscle. And in the next unit, we're going to talk about this neuromuscular junction, which is the nerve and the muscle. And we refer to that as the neuromuscular junction, or the NMJ. We're talking about this part in this unit. We will talk about this part in the next unit, what the muscle does with that signal. Make sense? <clears throat>
So now you have local trauma. You have your macrophages. It's in the periphery. If this was in the central nervous system, it wouldn't be macrophages at that area. It'd be what? A glial cell, microglial cell. But they don't do as good of a job. They're smaller. They're not as well equipped. The macrophages clean up the debris. The sprouting nerve finds the regeneration tube and starts growing down. And I appreciate this, this figure because if you notice, if you have a denervated muscle, you're going to get muscle atrophy. And so they start showing the thickness of this muscle here. You see these muscle fibers are thicker. Now they're starting to thin out. Here they're super thin, and now they plump back up once you've completely re the nerve. So you'll see that in patients that have, let's say, distal limb uh, atrophy. Like if you have a patient that has a lower spinal cord fracture, and maybe they're not quadriplegic, but they lose control of the lower limbs, they're going to have significant muscle atrophy in the lower, lower limbs, like the two legs, because of this characteristic, where the nerves are not sending a signal to the muscle, and so the muscle stops responding, and it, it, it atrophies or gets smaller. But a pretty cool process of how we can regenerate in the periphery. Now, why don't we do this in the central nervous system? Well, nerves in the central nervous system are highly metabolic. Make sure I say this correctly because I've mixed this up in the past. They're highly metabolic, but they're amitotic. In the central nervous system, you're born with the, number of ner the maximum number of nerves that you're going to have. And slowly as you age, the number of central nervous system nerves diminishes. The good news, it's very plastic. What I mean by that is, you know, it's like, you know, you, you, you map a location to a restaurant, you make a wrong turn, and then your map tells you at your earliest convenience, take the next right, right? It, it, you, you know, you still ignore it. At your next earliest convenience, take your next right. And we all laugh, but you kind of want to say, hey, dummy, make a U-turn and go the other way. So it'll reroute. The central nervous system can reroute, and that's how post-stroke patients can recover for future physical therapists. That's why PT is so helpful, is if you can actually figure out how to use different neural patterns and neural connections, reroute through different circuitry, train it, you can get this sort of phenomenon in a roundabout sort of way. You're not regenerating nerves because they don't divide. That's what amitotic means. But they're highly metabolic. So you put them through physical therapy. You get them up out of the wheelchair. You do passive muscle contraction. What does that mean? The patient's laying in the bed, and you're there, right, moving their leg, contracting for them until they can get up, and maybe they use the bar system. Maybe they start using a walker. Maybe they use a cane. And as a physical therapist, you, you're, you know, delighted when they're just walking on their own, right? That's post-stroke management for patients, different than the periphery, where we can get some regeneration, but in the um, uh, central nervous system, we don't see um, the division of these nerves that take place. There's actually one exception in the central nervous system, and that's memory and olfaction, believe it or not. Memory and olfaction. And what's interesting is those are very closely tied together, right? So let's use an example. I want you to close your eyes for a second, okay? And I want you to think back to your childhood on a very favorable memory, something that brings you joy. It could be, I, I hate to use some examples because they may bring you pain, but let's try, okay? Maybe your first win, your first ribbon, your first trophy, first team that actually won, or your first individual success as an athlete. Maybe it was a grade that you were working for. Maybe it was Christmas time. Maybe it's, you know, mom or dad or mo grandma, grandpa, okay? Just a f now I want you to think if you can think of a smell that reminds you of that event, right? So some of the most common ones are like remembering your grandparents, and the smell of their home when you walked in. 
or the smell of a certain food. Maybe it's an ethnic food that's specific to your family that reminds you of grandma or grandpa, right? And those will stay with you forever because the scent, the, the sense of smell and olfaction, uh, olfaction and memory are very, very closely connected. The neurons are shared. So the olfactory neurons and the hippocampus in the brain, we'll talk about that when we dive into the central nervous system in subsequent lectures. There is a very, very close connection there. It's kind of cool. So the rest of the central nervous system is amitotic except for these, but the metabolic rate of neurons is very, very high. And I already told you, it takes a lot of biological energy to actually wrap a neuron with myelin, and they're super active as it is, especially when you're awake, that you don't want to waste that energy on wrapping with myelin, something that you don't really need to wrap. If we have bundles of these nerves, they look like an arm-like process, and those bundles of nerves, like a bundle of wire, like how many of you have been like in a building or an office building, and you open like, you think you're going to the bathroom, you open like the, the IT closet, and you're like, there's all these blinking lights, and you see like bundles of wires coming out of the wall and stuff. So that's how we wrap nerves, in bundles. It's the same analogy that we wrap or how we organize muscle fibers, and we'll get to that next. We use the same architectural strategy. It's tracks. Those bundles of nerves are called tracks when you're in the brain and spinal cord. So clinically, you'll, you'll hear you know, physicians talk about this stroke, this track might have been affected. We're seeing complications in the patient on the left side of the body, right? In the periphery, we call them nerves, but in the central nervous system, they're referred to as tracks. So the different parts of the neuron, let's kind of dissect these a little bit more. Cell parts. This is just a specialized cell. That's it. It's really not anything all that complicated. It's a specialized cell. That's why we went through cell biology. It's going to have a nucleus. Right? It's going to have a soma, which is the body of the cell. It has all the organelles that you normally would expect it to have, except it's missing centrioles. Why is it missing centrioles in the nerve? It doesn't divide. So there's no centrioles. There's no need to have DNA separation. We have what we call nissel bodies. Um, we've got nuclei, clusters of cell bodies. These nuclei or clusters of cell bodies are found in the central nervous system, and the cluster of the cell bodies known as ganglia are referred to in the peripheral nervous system. Now, some of you are saying, well, what's a nissel body? Well, that's the same analogy as the endoplasmic reticulum in a regular cell. That's, we refer to it as a nissel body because the Discovery was made by Nissel, an individual named Nissel. Dendrites and an axon. So the dendrites are up here. They're receiving the information, sending it to the soma or the cell body, and then the axon distributes it down to the next nerve or to the next target organ. Okay? So this is like the antenna, the receiver. This is the cell body. This is the wire sending it to the next nerve or the next muscle or gland or whatever it is. Portions of the axon. This funnel portion right here, it's thin down here and it's kind of opened up at the top. That's referred to the, as axon hillock. And the axon hillock is important because in the action potential, we're going to talk a little bit about here in a moment, the tough stuff. You're going to reiterate it next week in our online lectures while I'm away. SIs and TAs are going to go over the action potential. But the axon hillock is where that signal collects to determine if you're going to fire an electrical signal or not. It's the go, no-go location, the axon hillock. That's why it's important. The axon collaterals, um, they're ones that actually send offshoots maybe to other nerves or other um, 
pathways. Remember how I was saying, this is how you reroute. This is the plasticity of the nervous system is an axon collateral that's a side road to another main road. Terminal branches. The terminal branches are down here. They end in a synaptic knob or axon terminal. And they innervate or they interface either onto a nerve or a muscle. If it's a muscle, it's called a neuromuscular junction. If it's another nerve, then you're going to send a neurotransmitter across that gap and allow it to receive it on the other side to propagate that action potential. Or that an action potential is just a term that means the electrical signal. The axolemma is the cell membrane. We just refer to it instead of cell membrane or plasma membrane, we refer to it as the axolemma. And the axoplasm is the cytoplasm inside of this cell. Because this long, funny-looking cell is just a cell. It's just elongated. And then it's got a special wrapping on its axon. And then it has a trigger zone, right, at the axon hillock. If we zoom in under scanning electron microscopy, this is the soma of a postsynaptic neuron. So that's up here. And these are the synaptic knobs. That's way down here. But this guy is innervating on something like this. Does that make sense? You have two in a row. And that's the interface of a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron. Make, make sense? So that's just two kind of in series. <clears throat> now, of course, we can further categorize this. These are the last two slides before we get in kind of the tough stuff that we have about 15 minutes to introduce. The two categories are either by um, function or by structure, nerves. So if we're going to categorize them architecturally or by the microanatomy, we're going to say that they're either multipolar, bipolar, or unipolar. That's by structure. If it's multipolar, multipolar is the most common type of neuron, multipolar. It's got three or more processes. It's got many dendrites. Oftentimes, there's very small or no axon. Most of the neurons in the brain are multipolar. Bipolar. This is the one we like to draw because it's the most aesthetically pleasing, okay? But this is the most common. But if you drew this, people would be like, what the heck's happening there? Here it's just nice and clean and organized, right? Like, that's what we drew right here is a bipolar, right? It's simple. But the most common is the multipolar. The bipolar, you got dendrites, you've got the axon, and then you, you have the axon terminals. Bipolar, one axon, one dendrite on either side of the soma. Nice and organized for all your type A personalities. You find these in the retina and the olfactory mucosa. Unipolar. Unipolar, you have a proximal and a distal branch. You can kind of see and appreciate that the axon is right in the middle, but it's off kind of off on the side found mostly in senses like light, temperature, sound. They usually have a, a specific type of structure for sending their specific signal. You know, sound is different than light. Uh, pressure is different than um, mechano sensation, right? Now, if we're going to categorize these by function, we could say they're sensory, back to the beginning of the lecture, if they're sensory, they're afferent neurons. So all afferent neurons typically are categorized as a sensory neuron, but that's a functional cat categorization. Or they could be motor neurons, efferent neurons. Functionally, they go to a muscle or a gland. Or they could be these inner neurons. So this is the same picture in the beginning of the lecture. The inner neurons are found in the central nervous system. They're the association neurons. So for the most part, moving forward, 
we're going to use this nomenclature, but I want you to be familiar with these. Okay? You should know some of those statistics that I shared with you. And if you didn't write them down, you can watch the recording. Make sense? Okay, it's time to wake up. If your neighbor is sleeping, joust them, dump some water on them, put your finger in their ear or whatever you need to do. I'm all out of inappropriate topics for today, so you're going to have to take the lead on that. Make them wake up. Resting and graded potentials. A potential. A potential is just an electrical difference. That's all it is. You're going to hear this word a lot. So <clears throat> let me ask you, what does it mean when a neuron fires? Somebody define that for us. What does it mean when a neuron fires? In the very back, there you go. Is it, is it just when it sends a signal? Yeah, very simple. The neuron fires, it, it, it sends a signal. It sends a signal down a direction from one side to the other. From the dendrites, it receives a signal. It processes that signal at the axon hillock, sends it down the axon to the terminal branches, to the synaptic knob, and propagates it across to another nerve in this unit. In the next unit, we'll say it's going to go across to a muscle, but we'll get there. So it sends a signal. Well, that signal is an electrical signal. It is electricity. So that we say that it's firing because it's sending an electrical signal. It's excitable tissue. The action potential is the active state of moving an electrical signal or electricity down the nerve. That's the action potential. Synonymous, you can see all these firing equals excitability equals action potential equals nerve impulse. All of those are synonyms. They all mean the same thing. We will mostly refer to it as an action potential, but I want you to understand, if we talk about excitable cells, we're talking about a nerve. Talking about a nerve impulse in a, in, a, in a paper that you read. That's an action potential. Now, I want you to flash back to the beginning of the class when we talked about the phospholipid bilayer. That's here. We talked about these transmembrane proteins. We've got a sodium channel in orange on your left. We've got a potassium channel in blue on your right. Now, you can hopefully appreciate the extracellular fluid is out here. The intracellular fluid, the ICF, is down low. What ion predominates the extracellular fluid? Sodium. Well done. What ion predominates the intracellular fluid? Potassium. Well done. What helps to maintain this organizational situation? What is that? Sodium potassium ATPase pump. Takes three sodiums out and two potassiums in. It's not shown on this slide, but that's what helps to keep this resting membrane potential here. Now, there's some other ions, right? You can look at the sodium concentration is 145. If you're not able to see these colors or you can't discriminate what I'm talking about, just read the text. Sodium, 145 milliequivalent per liter outside. Potassium, 4 milliequivalent per liter. Chloride ion, 110. Chloride ion is negatively charged. Do you need to know these numbers? It wouldn't hurt. It might help you remember it's high sodium out, low potassium in, right? Sodium inside the cell is 12 milliequivalent. Potassium inside the cell is 150 milliequivalent. They just flip-flop for the most part. And four, and 4 and 12 are almost the same number. 150 and 145, almost the same number. So if you're memorizing, say, hey, it's like 4 to 12, right, on the low side, and then it's like 145 to 150 on the high side. Those should be pretty easy ranges to remember. You also have these large anions or proteins that exist inside the cell. In fact, the ATPase sodium-potassium pump 
helps to maintain this slight negative charge. Let me explain. If you take more sodium out and you bring in less potassium, because three sodiums go out and only two potassiums come in, what's the net difference between three minus two? I know this is not a math class, but can we do this together? Right? Three minus two is, wow, one, right? So if we have three positive going out, two going in, we have a net loss of a positive out that creates a slight negative environment inside the cell. You follow. That slight negative uh, environment inside the cell measured right at that interface, right here, right underneath the phospholipid bilayer, is about minus 70 millivolts. If you move further away, it, it almost becomes zero. It has to be measured right here at the surface. That's how gentle that difference really is. <clears throat> so what ions can move across the plasma membrane? That's what PM stands for. And remember, if we're sending a nerve impulse, we got dendrites, we have our soma, here's our trigger zone, here's the axon. We're sending the current, otherwise known as electricity, the action potential from left to right. You follow? So inside, we've got passive channels, also known as leak channels. And one of them is referred to as a potassium leak channel. That means it's always open. It's always just letting a little bit of potassium to leave. That's a leak channel. Then there's active or gated that are regulated. A leak channel is like somebody left the, the yard gate open. An active channel is like the gate can open and close, but someone has to go open and close it. You can either activate the gated channel by a ligand binding, like you can see a ligand binding right here, allowing for sodium to come in, or you can activate it by electricity. It's not really any different than like your garage door opener. Or if you live in a fancy house and you have a gate that you pull up, you push a button and the gate opens to your property, right? You've seen them in the movies. So electrical gated or ligand gated, those are active style gates. The chemically gated that we have, uh, an example is the acetylcholine ion gate. Acetylcholine ion gate, we're gonna talk about in the future because that is a neurotransmitter that helps propagate the signal from one nerve to another or from a nerve to a muscle. Acetylcholine binds, it opens a gate. The voltage gated is where we're going to spend a lot of time on action potentials because if you're sending a signal of electricity, the moment that signal gets to the next voltage gate, it'll open. And it opens and it allows sodium to move which direction? In or out of the cell? Into the cell because it moves down its concentration gradient, right? So it's three sodiums out, high concentration of sodium outside the cell. You electrically open a gate, sodium's gonna move into the cell, bringing positive ions into the cell. You follow? If the cell is slightly negative to start, and you bring a voltage-gated channel to open, sodium voltage-gate channel open, sodium flows into the cell, does it make the inside of the cell more negative or more positive? Sodium is positively charged, the inside of the cell is slightly negative charged, minus 70 millivolts, I bring in a positive charge, does it make it more negative or does it make it more positive? Makes it more positive. Do you fundamentally understand that concept? That's an important concept to grasp, okay? So this resting membrane potential, you insert an electrode inside the cell, the other one outside the cell, you measure the difference, that's the potential. We measure that inside a neuron right at the interface just underneath the plasma membrane as minus 70 millivolts. That's the resting membrane potential. Again, I already said that only really occurs at the plasma membrane surface. Further away, you get closer or deeper into the cell, closer to the nucleus, it's really a neutral charge. It's like net zero. And positively, or sorry, negatively charged proteins and DNA and RNA contribute to a slight more negative environment inside the cell. 
But the real difference of this potential at that interface is maintaining it by moving three sodiums out and two potassiums in, the sodium potassium ATPase. So the membrane permeability is very important. So it's a potassium leak channel. So it's permeable to potassium. So potassium is going to constantly leave, right? Because it's high inside, so it's going to cost, constantly leak out. But sodium has to actually move by some other channel. So this pump that you see, um, it's not shown here, but here's our sodium channel. Here's our potassium channel. The potassium channel will always let potassium out. The sodium channel has to use a voltage or a ligand gate to open and allow sodium to come in. Now, <clears throat> there is a really simple um, video that I will post that you can watch that will nicely explain how the sodiums go out and the potassiums come in. Okay, So this I'll post on the announcements for you to watch. It's a very quick animated video. So when we look at the different neurons and we talk about sending a signal, we talk about sending the signal as a depolarization event. So when we say depolarization event, we're actually making the difference between the inside and the outside less. We're actually making it less negative, more positive. We call that a depolarization event. That change in membrane permeability and change in ion concentration can either be what we refer to as a graded potential or an action potential. If it's graded, it's local. And we'll see that terminology come up again and again. Graded means local. Local means it doesn't propagate all the way down the neuron. It never reaches what we call a threshold. If it never reaches that threshold, it's never converted to an action potential that goes all the way down the nerve. That's where we decide to fire the neuron or not. So a graded is local, an action potential carries on. Now, we talked about the different stimuli that can happen. We talked about uh, the different types of axons. I just want you to notice, this is a free nerve ending, this is a capsulated nerve ending, here's a receptor. These two are myelinated, this one is unmyelinated. This one transmits an electrical signal at 0.5 to 2 milliseconds. This one, right, does it in 12 to 30 milliseconds. Like, do you see the big difference between the different architectures of the nerve? Complex versus simple. Myelinated versus unmyelinated. Let me finish with this video. And what I'm going to do is the last few slides, I'm going to do a Zoom lecture. And I'll post that as a separate, so I don't want to rush through it where we're explaining the last few slides, setting you up for action potential. But in the last minute, I just want you to watch, oh, hang on, let me get this over here. I want you to watch this video. So do you see that membrane? You see the transmembrane protein? You got three sodiums binding, releasing them outside the cell. Down here, let me back this up a little bit. I want you to appreciate the energy that's being utilized. So do you see this ATP binding? Adenosine triphosphate, now it just cleaved it when this moved, burning the energy to move the three sodiums out. And if you wait for a second, you'll see two potassiums bind from the outside, bringing them inside the cell. Here they come. And this is where we'll stop. The last few slides in the lecture, I'll, I'll narrate those in my office, and I'll post those on YouTube so you can watch them before next week, right? All the research stuff that I was talking about slowed me down, and I don't want to rush through those last few slides, okay? Have a great next week, next two weeks. Have a wonderful spring break. I'll see you all when we get back.